Good evening. Welcome to the latest episode of Media Reporter. My name is Nadine Strassen, and I am delighted to be here to have a conversation with two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Anthony Lewis. Tony, it's been said that you are the person who single-handedly invented the field of Supreme Court reporting, and it's going to be wonderful to hear your lecture at New York Law School tonight, the annual Media Center lecture. The title is Individual Rights in a Time of War. Uh, before we turn to that topic, I'd like to say that the last time I saw you, uh, I had the honor of presenting you with the ACLU's top award, the Wa Roger Baldwin Medal of Liberty, for your lifetime contributions to civil liberties. And, and thank you for continuing those contributions with your writings about civil liberties in a time of terrorism. Now, one of the other times that I saw you quite recently, during the Clinton administration, you made a very dramatic statement. And my first question to you is whether you would like to revise that statement <laughs> in light of subsequent events. Maybe I'm already refreshing your recollection. Um, in light of a number of legislative measures that President Clinton supported, including the 1996 anti-terrorism law um, and immigration so-called reform law, you said that those five preceding years with a pre Democratic president and a Democratic majority in Congress during part of the time had been the worst period for civil liberties in your lifetime, or at least your adult lifetime. Is that still true, or has history changed that verdict? Some worse things have happened since then. I think it was true at the time. I think the uh, Immigration Act you're talking about has been one of the cruelest pieces of legislation I know of, separating families, throwing people out of this country for trivial offenses, like pulling somebody's hair, literally the case. And uh, the anti-terrorism law sort of opened the way to some of the things that are happening now, and it was a Outrage. You're talking about the 1996 anti-terrorism exactly. law. Yes. Uh, what was it called? Anti-terrorism. An e effective, effective death, death penalty, penalty yes, act. Yes, ADPA. Yes. What an Orwellian <laughs> term. Well, what many people don't realize is that many, some of the provisions that civil libertarians were able to stave off in that 1996 law were put on the shelf and, and pulled off again and became the 2001 anti-terrorism law, better known as the USA Patriot Act. Uh, do you think that that law is even worse in terms of concretizing abuses uh, or government power to abuse civil liberties? I think it is in ways, although I think some of the things that the administration has done on its own, without any statutory basis, uh, from my point of view, are worse and more menacing because they are claims of unilateral power on the part of the executive with, as far as I believe, no basis in law, whatever. And, and that this president has gone further than other presidents in that regard? Well, let me be candid. Mm -hmm. All presidents do things or have done things during wars when they happen to be in office mm -hmm. that were not very nice. It was Franklin Roosevelt who <coughs> took hundred more than 100,000 people of Japanese descent from the West Coast mm -hmm. to their homes, mm -hmm. put them in desert camps during World War II maybe the worst single, in terms of numbers, disgrace in American civil liberties history. Mm -hmm. It was Woodrow Wilson, whose attorney general uh, arrested thousands of uh, aliens in a night, A. Mitchell Palmer. It was Woodrow Wilson who enforced, who first got Congress to pass an Espionage Act and mm -hmm. a Sedition Act mm -hmm. that criminalized criticism of the president in a way that had not happened since 1798. The record of democratic liberal presidents hasn't been all that great. And it's one of the reasons why the ACLU, along with Anthony Lewis in your writings, have always been strictly nonpartisan. And uh, the ACLU was strongly criti critical of the Clinton administration, as were you in your writings, of the violations of civil liberties. And with that in mind... Let I'd, me just interrupt yeah, to say, yeah. indeed, the ACLU was born, as I recall, out of the excesses of the Woodrow Wilson period 
both the prosecutions and the sweep of aliens. Absolutely, and it's uncanny to see the resemblances between some of those yes. policies and what's happening now. As Roger Baldwin, the namesake of your Medal of Liberty Award, said, no fight for civil liberties ever stays won. Well, I wanted to ask, um, in light of this historic pattern, which you have written about very persuasively, and in light of the fact that uh, President Clinton reacted to the then worst terrorist act on U.S. soil with an anti-terrorist law that invaded civil liberties, gutted habeas corpus, um, do you think the civil liberties situation post 9-11 would have been markedly different if Al Gore had been elected president? I'm not sure it would. I, I think the single most important possibility of difference would have been in the question of who was Attorney General. Mm -hmm. uh, I will take an example not from a liberal democratic uh, administration, but Ed Levy, who was uh, President Ford's Attorney General, mm -hmm. uh, the, took him from the presidency of the University of Chicago. Ed mm -hmm. Levy was a very conservative uh, person politically speaking, but he was really sound on civil liberties and civil rights and very careful. He didn't do things rashly. He didn't convict people mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in speeches before they'd had a trial. Mm -hmm. And I think we would have been much safer with that kind of figure mm -hmm. uh, who had the, what shall I say, the inner confidence to mm -hmm. say, Mr. President, you know, this is a tough situation. We're up against terrorists who don't believe in the law, but we ought to emphasize that we do believe in mm -hmm. law. That's what we're for. I think someone like that would have made a great difference. Now, those are wonderful principles, and I have the delightful opportunity to be on the other side of the microphone. As you may know, I've been doing a lot of talks on these issues, so I'm now going to ask you the kinds of questions that I get from audiences all over the country, and um, I'm to some extent being devil's advocate, I'm sure. Why should the average law-abiding American citizen care about something like the Patriot Act or unilateral government powers if they are not terrorists themselves and they are not likely to be suspected of terrorists. Let's be even more bald about this because I think I have heard this question from audiences. I'm not even a Muslim or I am not even an immigrant from South Asia or the Middle East, so what do I have to worry about? Well, the answer is that powers uh, that presidents and attorneys general acquire in terms of unpopular figures like, well, to use your example, Muslims. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're unpopular, but evidently mm -hmm. your audiences are suspicious mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. as a group. Well, I think the United States government has yes, shown itself to be suspicious. Government is. Um, it can be then used against people who are, are not in the same category. I mean, the classic state is is uh, was the minister in Germany, what was, which minister oh, yes. was he? Martin Niemöller? Yes, exactly. Martin Niemöller, who said, uh, well, first they came for the communists and I didn't do anything because I wasn't a communist. Mm -hmm. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't mm -hmm. do anything because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me. Is there anything aside from that fear that in the future government powers might be applied to ordinary American citizens, is there uh, any particular power that the government has under the Patriot Act that already, or some other post 9-11 measure that already is adversely affecting the freedom of ordinary people? Well, actually, the Patriot Act has disturbed a very large number of what you call ordinary people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, dozens of communities around the country have passed, uh, you know, legislation or expository, you know, protest uh, mm -hmm. uh, messages of different kinds, including New York City, mm -hmm. City Council, and many other large and small, but lots of large cities mm -hmm. saying we don't want the Patriot Act. And my own library where I live in the summer, West Tisbury, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, mm -hmm. along with a lot of other public libraries, mm -hmm. uh, has adopted a resolution which requires that when people take out a book, as soon as they return it, the transaction is expunged from their records. The reason for that being that one of the, one of the provisions of the Patriot Act allows FBI agents to demand, not a subpoena that can be tested in court, but just to demand of a library, place of employment, a bookshop, or anything else, to know the reading habits, the meeting places, the friends of any citizen. And furthermore, makes it a crime for the person like the librarian who is asked to tattletale, makes it a crime for the librarian to tell the person whose uh, record is sought. And uh, I think 
a lot of people are troubled about and that. And that is indeed a power that reaches each and every one Absolutely. of us. And it applies not only to library records, but to any tangible thing right. held by anybody. Well, focusing specifically on the so-called enemy combatant cases, we of course have two categories of them. One involved American citizens who are being held in military brigs in this country. The other involved um, non-American citizens who were allegedly uh, captured on the field of battle, but they're disputing that. Uh, the administration is taking the position that none of these individuals should be entitled to any judicial review whatsoever, yet the United States Supreme Court has agreed to hear a couple of these cases. Are you, sur and against the government, strong opposition, uh, were you surprised as a court expert that the Supreme Court agreed to hear these cases, and, and is that a hopeful sign for civil liberties? It's a great mistake to predict what the Supreme Court is going to do, and I'm not going to fall into that because I really have no idea. Mm -hmm. But it was a surprise because they've, they've agreed to hear one of the domestic citizen cases, and mm -hmm. that's of a man named Hamdi, who was caught, I should say captured, seized, on or near the battlefield somewhere in Afghanistan during the Afghan war. Now, what he was doing, we can't tell. And he had a very extremely rudimentary uh, kind of review on habeas corpus mm. in which all the government had to do was to say we caught him in Afghanistan and that was enough to a majority of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Mm. Somebody who's caught on or near the battlefield uh, during a war, we don't worry about you know, little niggling details like whether he was fighting or just happened to be strolling by. <laughs> That's enough. Uh, the other case or worse yet, captured by a bounty hunter for the money, right? <laughs> yes. Might have been captured by the Northern Alliance. Mm. Uh, and we did pay money to the mm. Northern Alliance for turning over people mm -hmm. uh, that we suspected of terrorism or that they did, uh, or they regarded as an enemy. Or as an opportunity to get some money. <laughs> or as an opportunity to get some money. Uh, now, the other case, you spoke of two domestic mm -hmm. uh, enemy combatants being caught on or near the battlefield, but the other one was not. No. Jose Padilla no. was caught when he got off a, caught, arrested when he got off a plane in Chicago exactly. over the airport. And the claim is, uh, which Attorney General John Ashcroft made publicly in a television address, he said, we have caught a known terrorist, thereby convicting him before there's <laughs> been any hearing. Of course, there's been no hearing. Mm -hmm. There's been no trial. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been able to see a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He's been uh, detained now in solitary confinement for 20 months. Now, mm -hmm. how would you like that? With no idea how long you're going to be, no option to talk to anybody except your interrogators. Mm -hmm. And they were candid enough at one point to say, well, you can't, we don't want any uh, Mr. Padilla to see his lawyer because that might interrupt the interrogation process, which depends on um, trust and dependence. <laughs> trust and dependence between the interrogator and the subject, which is a way of saying we want to overbear his will. Uh, I thought that was pretty candid. I still get chills when I hear that, Tony. It sounds like something out of Soviet Russia. And you say you don't want to predict what the Supreme Court is going to do. But is it really conceivable that the United States Supreme Court could put a seal of approval under our Constitution to this complete black hole into which these people have been thrown without charge, without, uh, without the right to access to counsel, although I gather the government is saying, well, by our grace, we may exercise some discretion to allow you to they see counsel. They said that, counsel. but they haven't done but it, at least in the Padilla case. They have not allowed counsel to wonderful lawyers, uh, Donna Newman and Andrew Patel. New York Law School graduates, I should add. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> but is it conceivable to you? Yes, it's it conceivable. Is. I'm sorry to spoil your day, <laughs> but yes, it's conceivable. I say it is for this reason. Uh, in World War II, when the Japanese Americans were locked behind uh, barbed wire in Utah and the desert, um, the case went to the Supreme Court, Korematsu against the United States, and the Supreme Court said, we can't second guess what the military said. Now, in fact, what the military said was a bunch of trash and lies, as mm -hmm. we've later learned. Mm -hmm. But the court said, oh, no, we can't look into that. Mm -hmm. We have to accept their word. And Justice Jackson, dissenting, warned the very thing that you're talking about. We should 
if they're going to do it, let them do it without our getting into it. Mm -hmm. But for us to put our stamp of approval mm -hmm. on this terrible thing is to give it much more weight and to have a much more devastating effect on our civil liberties. That is true. Now, Fred Cormazzo, I have to interject, also is one of the distinguished winners of the Roger Baldwin Medal of Liberty, and uh, you're following in, in his footsteps. But in fairness, Tony, a lot has changed in American law since 1945. That was before we even had Brown versus Board of Education. So the U.S. Supreme Court had not robustly enforced the Due Process Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, even the First Amendment was a pale shadow of what it is now. I'm not defending the Korematsu case by any stretch of the imagination, but to reach a similar conclusion today would require overturning decades of jurisprudence that did not exist then. Uh, I think what you say is true. It's a, not just the court, but all of us are much more rights-oriented than we were certainly 50 years ago. That's Korematsu, almost, well, 49 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, or. 75 or 100 years ago, mm. the kind of thing that the Supreme Court approved in world, during World War I, putting in prison, people in prison for 20 years for criticizing, criticizing President Wilson's policy. I can't imagine anything that would be more protected. The central meaning of the First Amendment, Justice Brennan said, is the right to criticize the government. 20 years in prison for doing so. Um, so we're much more rights oriented, but I think you mustn't underestimate the temptation of judges to say, well, you know, there may be things we don't know. We're not experts on national security. We better let the executive branch worry about that. I mean, I certainly hope you're right, but I have an anchor to windward because I know there are far too many cases over the years, far too many, in which judges just shied away from anything that the government labeled national security. Well, let me ask you this, again, not asking you to predict what will happen, but Chief Justice Rehnquist, who has been very supportive of government power in general, also has been a very eloquent and forceful advocate for judicial independence. And don't you think that one could appeal to that aspect of his philosophy in terms of rejecting the administration's claims of unilateral, non-judicially reviewable power? Isn't that something that even Chief Justice Rehnquist would be upset about? I hope so. It's a good point, uh, which was summarized in the headline over an article by my former colleague, Linda Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And the, art, the headline was, The Imperial Presidency Against the, <laughs> the Imperial, Imperial Judiciary. Judiciary. And this court, the Rehnquist Court, has shown itself very sensitive to anybody muscling in on their territory. Mm -hmm. So let's hope that it continues. That would be a strategy. Now, I wanted to ask you about the other group. This was the group that I said um, had allegedly been captured on the battlefield, and that was those who were being held in Guantanamo, which uh, a British law lord, and apparently very unusual thing to do to make a public statement, uh, referred to as a legal black hole. Uh, and we've had uh, many unusual developments there, unusual briefs. You were telling me about one uh, beforehand that you might want to mention to our television audience. Uh, the brief of the parliamentarians? Well, and, and, and also the... Uh, oh, the brief of the, of the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an extraordinary thing. Um, President Bush, shortly after 9-11, uh, issued an executive order uh, laying down the rules for military tribunals to, to try any alien suspected of terrorism or harboring terrorists. Uh, no such tribunals have as yet been appointed. But they've sort of started setting up the possibility, and among other things, they've designated five military officers to serve as defense counsel. Mm -hmm. That's the way military courts work. Officers are there. And under the order, they could also go and get private counsel at their own expense. Mm -hmm. But the any defendants who were selected for trial. We, none have been selected yet, but anybody tried could pay their own money to get a civilian lawyer, if that lawyer could be cleared mm -hmm. for access mm -hmm. to classified documents, mm -hmm. or they can use these military lawyers. Five of those military lawyers have filed a brief in the Supreme Court of the United States saying this system is fatally flawed because it forbids us to go to a civilian court to challenge things that happen under this system, and that's not right. Uh, now, that was quite a brave thing for them to do. Uh, it's reminiscent, I, I was telling you, of something that happened during World War II. Quite amazing story I just read in manuscript in a book that will be published, oh, I don't know, maybe six or eight months. Mm -hmm. It's about the case of the Nazi saboteurs who were landed by submarine in the United States during World War II. 
case in the Supreme Court was called ex parte querin. And this is a very important precedent in the so-called enemy yes. combatant cases going to the Supreme Court Be now. Because that, well, because these people, A, two of the eight were, were American citizens, mm -hmm. and B, they were tried by military tribunal. Mm -hmm. And military officers, one in particular, were, were appointed to defend them. And the one in particular was a colonel called Kenneth Royal, who later, as it happens, became Secretary of the Army. Mm -hmm. But during World War II, he was a colonel. President Roosevelt issued an order saying how this tribunal should be conducted and forbidding the lawyers for the defendants to go to a civilian court. Kenneth Royal, after his appointment, he's a colonel in the Army. Yeah. The commander-in-chief has just yeah. issued an order. He writes a personal letter to President Roosevelt saying, Dear Mr. President, you can't do what you just did. You can't forbid me to go to a civilian court. I'm going to go to the Supreme Court of the United States. The next thing he knew, he got a phone call from the President's secretary saying, Come to the White House. He waited in the ante room for two hours while the matter was discussed between the secretary and the president. He never got to see the president, but the secretary came out and said, the president has given you your order. Royal then wrote another letter saying, yeah. Mr. President, I am interpreting what you said to me to allow me to go to the Supreme Court. Wow. And he didn't get a further letter, and he did. That's so inspiring. And see, this is why I have reason to hope from our independent um, bench and bar. Now, I, I want to ask about your other profession, um, that of being a journalist. I've heard some criticism from other journalists ab about the media coverage of civil liberties issues post 9-11. What's, and of course your writings have been terrific, but in general do you think the public is getting adequate coverage, fair coverage, adequate information about these issues? No, I think that the press has been very slow to take uh, notice of what's happening. There have been little stories about Padilla and Hamdi, for example, but maybe a few more thorough stories, but mostly little shorts, you know. When Hamdi, the first one, was arrested and held without access to counsel, I saw a story about that long in the New York Times and I, I you know, I just was shocked. I mm -hmm. guess I'm easily shockable, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like Claude Rains <laughs> in Casablanca. <laughs> anyway, uh, Louis, well, I've forgotten his last name. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's not a laughing matter. I no, thought it right. was very serious yeah. and I just was amazed that it was that short a story. So no, we haven't paid a lot of attention. The public hasn't paid a lot of attention, as we were saying, and those two were related. The press doesn't operate in a vacuum. It tends both to inform the public and to reflect the degree of public interest in a subject or political interest. And members of Congress have not been terribly exercised about civil liberties, and that has had a role. The ACLU has but maybe the press is not sufficiently attentive to the ACLU. Oh, thank you very much. And one of your lines in talking about Congress's role was, was uh, you described Bush as being able to work very well with a supine Congress. Although lately there has been bipartisan pressure in Congress, I think responding to the local community resolutions that yes. you referred to earlier to uh, trim back the excesses of the USA Patriot Act. Well, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the uh, press not adequately giving information, uh, the, in fairness, the Bush administration has had many secrecy policies, uh, in fact, throwing an unprecedented shroud of secrecy over every aspect or many significant aspects of the post-9-11 investigations, secret deportations, secret hearings, secret <laughs> arrests. Um, in your experience over decades now, is this um, unusual? Is this extreme? Or is this, again, part of a pattern that goes all the way back to Woodrow Wilson? I don't think it, I, I don't know what, what went on in terms of secrecy mm -hmm. in the Wilson administration. Um, I think it certainly is the height of secrecy in recent times, mm -hmm. and it, it has been very strongly applied. I mean, I, you mentioned in passing one example, which I'll expand on a little, mm -hmm. and that is uh, that in the weeks after September 11, uh, on the orders of Attorney General Ashcroft, the FBI arrested several thousand aliens in the United States. They were held without charge for weeks and in many cases for months uh, in places of detention like the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. Uh, it was, their names were not disclosed. Their places of detention were kept secret. Their families didn't know where they were. And in fact, the Metropolitan Detention Center, when families got the idea that their uh, husbands or fathers or whatever might be there, and asked, said, no, he's not here, when in fact he was there. And some very terrible things happened to those people. It, uh, we have to give credit. 
the Inspector General of the Justice Department, Glenn Fine, mm -hmm. uh, issued a report saying, you know, they were brutalized, they were lied to, uh, they were humiliated, they were kept in cells uh, in solitary confinement with fluorescent lights on 24 hours a day. They were thwarted in their efforts to get access to counsel. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so they were very badly treated and all, as you said, under a cloak of secrecy. Well, we have very little time left. I'd like to ask you one question on a different subject. You've written two acclaimed books about major landmark Supreme Court cases, Gideon versus Wainwright on the right to counsel and New York Times versus Sullivan on First Amendment right to criticize the government. If you had time, uh, which other Supreme Court case or cases would you choose to write another wonderful in-depth book about? <laughs> you know, I really can't answer that because um, it takes a lot to dislodge my, what shall I say, my spine, mm -hmm. <laughs> my sits flush. <laughs> <laughs> You're so prolific. I don't, I don't accept well, that. Well, it takes a lot to get me to write a book because that's mm -hmm. a different kind of an enterprise. enterprise. It mm -hmm. takes, um, you know, most journalists have a short attention span. Mm -hmm. That's our secret. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we get all well, excited. readers do too, so you're a perfect match. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so there isn't a particular case uh, as yet. I think, let's put it this way, if the cases we've been talking about turn out the way I hope yes. they turn out, that would be a fit subject. Oh, fantastic. With some brave lawyers, too. So that's another reason to hope for the right result. Um, I probably have only one minute left, so I want to ask you a question about um, you are, happen to be married to a Chief Justice of a state Supreme Court. Has that given you any different or added perspective onto the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court in terms of their role and their decisions and how they function? Yes. My wife is Margaret Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. The insight it's given me is how judges can disagree strongly among themselves. They decide the case and then they go on. Mm -hmm. They don't hate each other. They go on and decide the next case in a congenial way. I could never do that. I couldn't be a judge because I'd keep thinking about the last case. Why didn't I get one more vote? You can't do that if you're going to be an appellate judge. You just have to keep going. Okay. Well, that's, that's very good to hear. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure to have the chance to talk to you. I know that our audience is very benefited by this extraordinary privilege. And I want to thank you so much, not only for being here tonight, but for your writings. I'm glad in some sense that you say you have a short attention span because you keep cranking out those columns, which are um, the antithesis of the general problem you described about the press not being attentive enough to our civil liberties situations. You are being eternally vigilant. And thank you for all of the information and all of the inspiration. Well. I thank you very much for that. It means a lot to me. But I want to tell you, our freedom really depends on the lawyers and judges mm -hmm. in this very law-oriented country. And we're training them at New York Law School. Thank you. <laughs>